I should rec- okay, so I should record early on. So to reiterate, we're going to cover lessons six and seven today. Today's uh, Monday, August 24th. Lessons one through 10 will be due, uh, as of now, it'll be due Thursday, September 10th, the day after our primary homework one session. All right. Uh, oh, I have a question in chat here. Uh, you just wanted the homework emailed directly to you. Yes, yep, yes. E- you're going to email the homework to me. Uh, the d- Whoops. Uh, the due date, again, is Thursday, September 10th. As of now, Thursday, September 10th, the day after our primary homework one session. Lessons one through 10 due Thursday, September 10th. Okay. And on, on uh, September 9th, we'll mostly cover the answers, but you need to be prepared by then. Uh, anything else in chat before we start? Anything else in chat? All right. Well, go ahead and keep chatting. I'll go. Okay. We're, we are recording. Yes. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have more homework than last week. That's for sure. So let's start. All right. Hi, everyone. Let's do lesson six on symmetry, skewness, and modality. What is the shape of a distribution? When we talk about the shape of a distribution of quantitative data, we're basically talking about the shape of a good histogram for that quantitative variable. All right, so part A, the shape of a distribution. The distribution of a variable in general consists of its possible values together with their frequencies or relative frequencies. Later on, we'll talk about probabilities. So here, for example, we're talking about uh, the various ages of the US presidents when they became president and their corresponding frequencies for these age classes. So for example, uh, we had 13 presidents in their early 50s, 12 presidents in their late 50s, and so forth. The shape of a distribution refers to the shape of a frequency or relative frequency histogram for quantitative data. So we're focusing on histograms for quantitative data. And again, the shape or a histogram or distribution may be described by its symmetry, skewness, and or modality. We'll talk about these issues. All right, what do we mean by symmetry? What do we mean by a symmetric distribution? Well, here's an ideal picture here. Take a look at this nice curve here. Uh, what do we often call this kind of curve? We often call it, we often call it a bell curve, which we see of a lot of in statistics. So think of this as a really smoothed out histogram. Uh, Later on, when we talk about continuous distributions, we'll talk about these kinds of smooth curves here. Now, this distribution, again, think of this as a smoothed out histogram here, uh, is bell-shaped, and a perfect bell-shaped distribution is perfectly symmetric. So what do we mean by symmetric? We can imagine a vertical line called an axis, and if you have perfect symmetry, the left half and the right half of the curve are perfect mirror images of each other about this vertical axis. So again, the bell curve below is perfectly symmetric because it can be divided into two halves about this vertical axis. The two halves, the left half and the right half, are mirror images of each other, and we have perfect symmetry. Now, we rarely see perfect symmetry. Uh, For example, if you look at this frequency histogram for president's ages, well, some people might call this approximately symmetric. Uh, You rarely get perfect symmetry from real life data. Uh, But some people might call this histogram approximately symmetric. Some people might say not so much. It can be a subjective judgment, which is one reason why some pure mathematicians are annoyed with statistics because you sometimes have these subjective judgments. Is this about symmetric? Many people would say yes, but some people would say no. Now, this distribution is certainly symmetric. This is a perfectly flat or uniform distribution. So this is a situation where exactly 10% of students in the class scored between zero points and nine points, exactly 10% score between 10 points and 19 points out of 99 or 100 points. So these students down here did very poorly. So here you had exactly 10% of L- students. Let me pause. Uh, uh, some students are having some volume issues. 
Uh, how's it going with the vo- <clears throat> how's it going with the volume? I'm unmuted, uh, so uh, check your volume controls. Okay, so make make sure that you know all all the. <laughs> okay, so uh, okay, so the students who had some trouble before are are you doing better now? Okay, let me let me check. Uh, Oh, um, so so the student who asked, uh, you're you're uh, you're you're not in you're you're not uh, in blue on my chat. There might there's there might be uh, something wrong with your connection because you're not you're not your name's not in blue in my chat, huh? Okay, uh, let's continue on. But yeah, try to check your volume, students, in each of ten classes. Now, this rarely happens in practice, but let's say hypothetically, this is what we see. That we have a perfectly uniform or flat distribution. Uh, And a perfectly uniform distribution is perfectly symmetric. Now, a question for you. Where else might you see a uniform distribution? Let's say you're playing a game of chance. (laughs) Where else might you see a uniform distribution? If you do what a whole bunch of times? How about if we roll a die 100 times? Roll a standard six-sided die 100 times. So on the horizontal axis, you would have one, two, three, four, five, and six, the possible values of the die face that shows up. And if you were to actually roll a die 100 times and do a frequency histogram, or perhaps a relative frequency histogram, let's say a relative frequency histogram, then for a standard six-sided die, you should get about one-sixth ones, about one-sixth twos. It won't be perfect. 100 is not divisible by six. It won't be perfect. But it should basically be flat. You have no reason to think like over here. You have no reason to think that you'd have a whole bunch of threes and fours compared to the others. So it should be a roughly uniform distribution. Not perfect, but a roughly uniform distribution. And in fact, the theoretical distribution for die faces would be perfectly uniform. One-sixth proportion for each face. One-sixth probability for each face. So we do see... Uh, roughly uniform distributions in practice. And sometimes we see perfectly uniform distributions in theory, like the probability theory for rolling dice. Now, what if we don't have a symmetric or an approximately symmetric distribution? We might have a skewed distribution. A skewed distribution is a type of asymmetric, that is a non-symmetric distribution, that has a long tail. So all skewed distributions are asymmetric, but not all asymmetric distributions are skewed. For example, uh, this here would be an asymmetric distribution, but it's not skewed in any way. This here is an example of a left skewed distribution, or a distribution that's skewed to the left. Again, think of this as a smoothed out histogram. It's called a left skewed distribution because it has a long tail extending to the left. Now, this can be confusing to people. Remember that the name of the skewness describes the tail. It refers to the tail. Because a lot of students might be thinking, well, wait a minute. I see this big lump on the right side. Yeah, so do I. But still, we say that this distribution is skewed to the left or it's left skewed. The name of the skewness describes the tail. The tail goes off to the left. Now, where do we see left skewed distributions? I can tell you as a teacher, we often see them on the first exam for a class. So for example, uh, this would be a very reasonable example for a relative frequency histogram for test scores for a class, where most of the students get A's, B's, C's, or D's, but then you have a, a long tail of students who don't do so hot, maybe students who weren't prepared at all for the class. They did not have the appropriate prerequisites, perhaps. So this often happens on the first exam of a class. But I have a question for you. Think about this. If students are allowed to drop out of the class, 
the course. What is likely to happen to this shape, this distribution of scores on future tests? So if this is the shape of the histogram or distribution or quiz number one, and if students are allowed to drop the class, how do you think the shapes will differ for quiz number two, quiz number three, quiz number four, and so forth? How do you think the shapes would differ? How do you think these shapes will change as students drop the class? Well, what's likely to happen is that, uh, well, the students who are likely to drop the class are the ones who are doing relatively poorly. So the students who are more likely to drop are more likely to be in the long tail here. So the students in the long tail, I, I, I feel like it's rather dark humor to put a big cross or X here, but uh, the idea is that uh, many of the students here in this left tail uh, may well drop the class. And perhaps if some students are caught cheating up here, but then they'd be down here, right? I'd knock them down, right? Get zeros. <laughs> so, so let's say that no one's cheating, all right? Let's say no one's cheating. Well, what's probably going to happen is that you're going to have uh, drops in the long left tail of the class. And then when you look at the remainder of the class for the later quiz in the course, it's more likely that, that the uh, shapes in the later histograms are more likely to be symmetric. They're more likely to be more symmetric. Well, these are examples of left skewed distributions. Well, here's some right skewed distributions. The distribution here is skewed to the right, or it's right skewed. Again, because the long tail extends to the right. We call it right skewed because we have a tail extending to the right. So here's an example of a histogram that exhibits right skewness. And there is one subject I can think of where if you have a test out of, say, 100 points, you may well get a relative frequency histogram that looks like this. There's one subject in mind in particular that's notorious for reducing this kind of shape. I've heard this happening quite a bit in physics classes. I've heard of physics problems where they would have common characters jumping onto ropes and you have all these different forces and issues at play. I would fail those tests, by the way. But I've often heard of physics exams where a lot of students will be scoring 20%, 30%. Uh, and these are students who might be pretty good at physics, actually. So uh, then these are classes where you really hope that the grades would be curved or that something would be done differently with the grades instead of straight scale. It would be very depressing if these were the only students getting the A's. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about issues of symmetry and skewness. Next, we're going to talk about issues of modality, and we'll describe various shapes of distributions. Next time. All right, any questions before we go on? Any questions before we go on? All right, let's proceed. Keep chatting. Hi, everyone. Let's now talk about oh, issues oh, oh, oh. of modality, basically humps. So all but one of the distributions so far have been unimodal, meaning that they only had one mode or hump, hence unimodal. Uh, let's quickly review. So this over here, this nice bell shape, one hump one mode, unimodal. Likewise here, for this approximately symmetric bell shape, unimodal. Example three is the one exception, where we had a perfectly flat distribution. Uh, for a flat uniform distribution, this has no mode. Now even skewed distributions can have modes. This is unimodal. This is unimodal. Here, the concept of unimodal uh, is a bit fluid. Unimodal, right skewed. Again, unimodal. Uh, now, as I said, the whole concept of uh, modality involving humps, uh, that is a bit fluid. Uh, later on, we're going to have a different definition of a mode for raw data, for lists of values. That's a bit more precise. Right now, we're just thinking humps in the shapes. Now over here, we have a bimodal distribution. 
where we have a couple of humps. Uh, looks like we have one over here and one over here, roughly speaking. Again, it's a bit fluid. But we can call this a bimodal distribution. We have a hump on the left, a hump on the right. Now, if this is a distribution of test scores, what could explain the bimodality? Uh, and sometimes, as a TA in a calculus class at UCSD, I might see these kinds of bimodal distributions. How do you think these kinds of bimodal distributions might arise in a calculus test, for example? Well, basically students who basically knew their stuff and students who had to pray to the god of partial credit. <laughs> People who are basically accumulating partial credit but may not have aced any particular problem. So the students who studied versus the students who were writing on partial credit. Sometimes I did see bimodal distributions. A multimodal distribution has more than two modes. <laughs> so something like this. Here you might be thinking of a camel. Here you have three or four humps. That's multimodal. All right, so let's talk about describing distributions that we've seen. So let's talk about these five shapes that we've seen. How could you describe them? I'll give you 20 seconds to review these. How would you describe them in terms of symmetry, skewness, and modality? So let's talk about A. How would you describe A? A is a perfectly uniform distribution, which means it's symmetric and it has no mode. Saying it's uniform implies the others. That's symmetric and it has no mode. What about B? That's like for the president's ages. Well, it's unimodal and it's approximately bell-shaped and therefore approximately symmetric. What about C? That's like test scores for quiz one. It's unimodal and left skewed. Remember, the skewness follows the tail. It's left skewed. What about D? Test scores in a physics class. Again, it's unimodal, but this time it's right skewed. The tail extends to the right. How about E? Bimodal and neither symmetric nor skewed. Although in principle, you could have a bimodal symmetric distribution. You could have something like this, for example, that's bimodal and symmetric. But here, this is bimodal and asymmetric. While we're at it, why don't we go to Shodor.org and look at this real world data. I'll blow this up. College, a uh, college's SAT math scores. What do you think? I would say unimodal, skew to the right. You have some students who did very well relative to the others. NBA team payrolls. Uh, maybe unimodal over here, skew to the right. You have some people being paid very well over here. Where's power of cars? Um, could be unimodal, possibly bimodal, skew to the right, perhaps. Cars that do quite well over here on the right, very powerful. Body fat of men. I would say unimodal, pretty symmetric. A little bit of skewness here, but pretty symmetric. You see, real world data is not perfectly categorized. <laughs> Spending per student in some schools. Uh, looks unimodal, looks, what do you think, skew to the right. Gas mileage for year 2000 cars. Maybe unimodal, skew to the right. Some cars are very efficient. All right. That's lesson six. Shapes of histograms and distributions. Next up, we're gonna talk numbers. 
All right. Any questions before we start cranking some numbers? That was lesson six. Any questions before we go on? Are you okay? Any questions before we go on? Any questions before we go on? All right. Let's uh, let's go on then. Next time. Hi, everyone. Lesson seven on measures of center. Where is the data value-wise? So let's say that we have a class with 100 students. They take a test, and I have now a list of their 100 test scores. How would you find a central or representative score? We're looking for a measure of center. And we're going to look at four measures of center. So for example, if I gave you five minutes to find a measure of center and I give you a scientific calculator, what would you do? Number two, what if I gave you five minutes but I didn't allow you to use a calculator or a computer? How would you find a central measure? Number three, what if I gave you 20 seconds? You scan over these 100 scores, how would you find a measure of center? Number four, how about 10 seconds? <laughs> four measures of center. What are four things you could do to find a central or representative value? All right, let's say that I allow you five minutes and a scientific calculator. What would a lot of people do? They would take the average or mean of these 100 test scores. How would you find the average of 100 test scores or 100 numbers? Add up all 100 numbers and divide by 100. So let's do that. Uh, or instead of that, let's, <laughs> let's consider five test scores. 100 test scores might be too much. I'll, I'll go over Excel later, but let's do it by hand first. Example one, five test scores. The five students in a class take a test. Their scores in points are as follows. 80 points, 76 points, 100 points, 83 points, 100 points. How do we find a single number that tells us how well the class did? So after I've graded the test, the class of students ask me, so how well did we do? And they want me to give them one number, a central or representative score. So let's look at four possibilities of measuring the center for a quantitative data set. All right. Well, again, the natural choice would be the arithmetic mean or average, assuming you have a calculator or Excel or some software. Now, there are other measures called means, but the arithmetic mean, or simply the mean or the average, is by far the most common. Uh, for example, in a geometric mean, you multiply the numbers and take the nth root. All right, so in our example one, the mean of the five test scores would be obtained by taking the sum of the five test scores, the five data values, adding them all up. There are two 100s, so they do count twice, right? And you divide that by the number of values, five. There are five test scores. If you do that, you should get well, the sum of the scores was 439 points. Divide by five, and you get exactly 87.8 points. Technically, you should put a unit there, 87.8 points. So that's our measure of center if you use the arithmetic mean or average, 87.8 points, which would seem reasonable. An overall score for the class. Now, by the way, if you were working this out on a calculator, would this be appropriate? Think about it. Would this be appropriate? If you go 80 plus 76 plus 100 plus 83 plus 100 divided by 5 equals, would that work to find a measure of center, to find the mean? Well, the answer is no. I say here, what would be wrong with doing this? <laughs> well, here's the problem. If you were to enter this into your calculator straight up, 
what would be the first operation your calculator would do? By the order of operations, oops, as I would say, by the order of operations, the first operation your calculator would perform would be the division. 100 divided by 5 is 20, and then it would add the 20 to these four other numbers. That's not what you want, right? You want the sum of these divided by 5. So you have to group the numerator somehow. Warning, group the numerator. You must group or compute or process the numerator before dividing by 5. And you can do this by using maybe parentheses uh, on your calculator around the numerator, or you can work the sum out on your calculator, then press enter or something like that before dividing by five. But remember, you have to process the sum, process the numerator before dividing by five, and then press equals or enter. Just doing this won't work. A few notes on rounding. Now here, uh, the average was exactly 87.8 points, but even if we had gotten something like 87.7999 or something, we still would have wanted to round off to 87.8 points. Uh, the rule is that we want to round off to one more decimal point relative to the original data values. The original data values Place. were given in integers, zero decimal places, right? We had zero decimal places in the original data, so we go to one decimal place when reporting a mean. Notes on rounding. For now, we will typically round off our final answers to one more decimal place than the number of decimal places provided in the given data. Since the given data were data values in integers, rounded off to zero decimal places, we round off our final answers to one decimal place, to the nearest 10. Avoid rounding intermediate results. So if you're doing calculations, you don't want to round off too much in the middle. Let's say you wanted your final result accurate to one decimal place. Well, if, if you have things rounded off in the middle, you don't want to round off too much. Uh, so I, actually, if you wanted your final answer rounded off to five decimal places, you don't want to round off in the middle to one decimal place. That's not enough. <laughs> and, and the memory button on your calculator can help. Always read the instructions on exams. They'll take precedence. Later on, we're going to discuss trimmed means, uh, and you're going to see a, a purpose for that. Now, before we go on to other measures, let's talk about this idea of the average or the arithmetic mean. Let's go to Excel. So here we have the five test scores in any order. It doesn't matter. Remember, the 100 is counted twice because we had two students getting 100s. To find the mean, we type equals, actually average. The word mean won't work. The command is average. Equals average. And then you can either type in B2 colon B6 uh, for the first and last entries we want in the column, or you could just move your mouse over these entries and it'll automatically say, hey, you want the ones from B2 through B6, those cells, and parenthesis, and you get the average, which you can see is 87.8 points. You should put the unit, and that's the mean, 87.8 points. Let's be more ambitious. Remember the presence data. Over here, the presence data. What's the average of these 45 President's agents, right? Let's do it. Equals average. It's from B2 to B46. Ah, it's exactly 55 years. So 55 years is the average, the arithmetic mean of the ages of the 45 presidents. Uh, Trump is at 46 because uh, row number one consists of headers. Keep that in mind when you're using Excel. Row number one also often consists of headers. So we wanted from B2 to B46. The average was 55 years, which makes sense. It's good to look over the data points and uh, see if your average makes sense. Uh, if you had gotten 550 years, you probably made a mistake. Like if I had done 700 for Trump, uh, the mean is uh, going to be a fair bit off. All right. Next time, we'll look at other ways of measuring the center for a data set. So what's another way? of figuring out the center of a data set, right? A hundred test scores. What's, what are some other central or representative values we could use? Okay. So keep thinking about that. We're gonna look at three other major measures. Any questions in the meantime? Any questions in the meantime? 
All right, again, again, feel free to keep chatting. Let's go on. Hi, everyone. Let's find a second measure of center for these 100 test scores. Let's say that you had five minutes to find a measure of center, but you didn't have a calculator or computer then what could you do first? It might take some time to do it by hand, but what might you do first with these 100 data values? And then which data value would you pick? Or another way to look at this, wouldn't it be great if a computer, a basic computer, could do what with these data values first? How about sort them from lowest to highest? And then find the middle value in the sorted list. That's called finding the median. Kind of like how you have a median in the middle of the highway, right? The median. Assume that we have a population data set of size capital N. Uh, we can also talk about sample data. But uh, let's say assume we have a population data set of size capital N. If capital N is odd, say five, like in our example one, then the median is the data value in the middle position, ah after sorting the data, you have to sort the data first. So these five mm -hmm. test scores here, in these five test scores, you don't just grab the 100 points just because it's physically in the middle now, mm -hmm. right? You have to sort the data first in increasing or decreasing order. Now ties are permitted. So technically, instead of increasing, we should, uh, we should say non-decreasing. Instead of decreasing, we should technically say non-increasing, but I think these words are kind of confusing to people. So instead, we'll just say sort the data in either increasing or decreasing order and just allow for ties. Okay, so in example one, we had five test scores. 80, 76, 100, 83, and 100 in points. Now, what's the median? Again, don't just grab the 100 just because it's in the middle now. You first have to do what? You first have to sort or order the five data values. Normally we do it in basically increasing order, although we could also do it in decreasing order. Remember, you have to sort first. So let's start with the lowest score, which is 76 points. Then the next lowest score is 80 points. And then the next lowest score is 83 points. Now, if you recognize that the median is going to be the third lowest score, then we can stop here. Uh, later on, we'll talk about the median position number, which will tell you which, which score you need. Uh, in this case, we need the third least score, the third lowest score. How do you know which score you need? Uh, but once you know that 83 is the third lowest score, then you're done. It's true that the fourth lowest score is 100, and the fifth lowest score is actually the highest score. It's also 100. All right, now, after you've sorted the data values, now you can grab the physically middle value, which is 83 points, don't forget your unit. And it makes sense that 83 points is a central or representative value. Uh, it's reasonable to tell that to the class. Overall for the class, 83 points. That's like an overall score for the class, a central or representative value. Now here's one characteristic for the median. Okay. Observe, that the median has the characteristic that we have two values below it, we have two values below the 83 points, and we have two values above it. We have two values above the 83 points. So observe that there are as many data values below the median as above. In this case, we have two values below the 83 points and two values above the 83 points. Bear in mind that ties are okay. If the median is tied with other scores, then this might not be the case. So for example, if instead of 100, we had 83 points over here, then technically we wouldn't have two values above the 83 points. Uh, we could say that we have two values that are at least as high as 83 points over here, but basically ties are okay. So if we have ties, don't be bothered by that. All right. Now, we run into an issue if n is even. For example, four. If n is even, then the median is going to be the average of, or the midpoint between, 
the two, the, two, the two data values in the two middle positions. Again, after sorting the data. I must stress, this is done after sorting the data. So let's say that we have four test scores. Capital N is four, N is even. So let's say we uh, lop off the 100. Let's say, I, let's say I find out that this person cheated. Ooh, bad student. <laughs> That's the only time that I have a bad student, when a student cheats. So let's say I eliminate 100 from the data set. First, I must say uh, that I'm doing that. I must report that I'm eliminating, eliminating that data point. Don't just throw out data because you feel like it. So I'm telling you, I'm eliminating the 100 because of cheating. So we're down to these four data points. All right, we sort them. Again, from lowest to highest, we have 76, 80, 83, and 100. The problem with finding the median here is that we have two data values in the middle, the 80 points and the 83 points. So what do we do? We take the midpoint, the average, between these two middle values. The two middle values are 80 and 83 points, so we take their average, kind of like their midpoint. How do we take the average of these two values? How do you average two numbers? You add them up and divide by two. So we add the 80 and the 83, process that, process the sum before you divide by two. We take the sum, divide by two, and we get 81.5 points. Don't forget your unit. So the median is 81.5 points, which again is a reasonable measure of center. Notice it's a little bit different from the 83 points we got up here. Why is the median a little bit lower? And this is going to lead up to something we're going to talk about later on. How come the median shrank? It's down to 81.5 points. The reason is we busted a student for cheating. The 100 here up here was eliminated, which had the impact of lowering uh, the median. And also the mean, by the way. All right. Now, how do we know which data value to stop at? So once we've sorted a big old list, how do we know when to start? How do we know that we're done once we get the third lowest value, which is also, by the way, the third highest value? Well, we can find the median position number. The median position number. Now, before I go on to that, yes, on Excel, you can do this in a very straightforward manner. Equals median. I can scan my mouse over these. We get B2 through B6. We get 83 and then put points. Okay, that verifies what we had before. Yes, the median was 83 points. So if you have Excel, yes, you can find the median. Remember that you put an equal sign to start off the command. Okay. Uh, now, well, let's say we have our presidents, all right? Again, we can find the median for the presidents. Uh, we're from B2 to B46, all right? Oh, it turns out that the median matches the mean, 55 points, which if you look Here's. at the, uh, the list of presidents' ages, that seems to make sense. Uh, whether you take the mean or the median, you get 55 not points, 55 years. <laughs> you get 55 years, okay? Uh, 55 seems to be a reasonable measure of center if you look at the 45 ages here. But let's say that we have a sorted list and uh, we want to know which value to pick. So let's say that uh, the median command is busted, right? Well, first, you have to remember to sort the values. And while we're at it, let's, let's sort the corresponding name while we're at it. So we need to sort these by age. So I'm going to sweep over these two columns. Uh, and I'm going to sort both these columns according to age. Let's go from smallest to largest. We're going to go in increasing or technically non-decreasing order. And there we go. Uh, and, and by uh, uh, shading in both columns of data, uh, I am carrying the name along with the age. So we go from the youngest president, Teddy Roosevelt, at 42, over to the oldest, Trump, at 70. Okay, Joe Biden is trying to beat Trump over here at the higher end. Right? So we have to sort the data first. Now, let's say that uh, uh, we forgot the median function, or it doesn't, it doesn't work in our Excel software. Which president do we want in this list? 
Okay, which row do we want? Well, first of all, we might want to delete row number one, which has the headers. That could confuse us. So let's delete the row of headers. Delete the row of headers, row number one, all right? What's the median position number? Okay, uh, it's the row number of the median value. Okay, so if we have 100 data values, which one do we want? Okay, n is, n is 45 here. Okay, we have 45 values here. Okay, 45 plus one over two, all right? Uh, well, okay, so it's gonna be, I'll put the equal sign in front, 45 plus one over two. Well, 46 divided by two is 23. We have 45 data values here. The median position number is given by this formula. N plus one all over two. 45 plus one is 46. Divide that by two, you get 23. Which means that we go to row number 23. Row number 23, Benjamin Harrison. Who, who was, lo and behold, 55 years old. That's why Excel picked 55 years as the median. Because Benjamin Harrison, who was the 23rd youngest president, was 55 years old. Bear in mind, there are ties, but that's okay. Ties are okay, All right, including the man he beat, uh, the man, including the man he beat and who beat him, <laughs> uh, Grover Cleveland. Yeah, a weird coincidence, uh, Benjamin Harrison was the 23rd president, so just kind of a weird coincidence. He was also the 23rd youngest. <laughs> All right. So how did we find that median position number? Again, it's given by this formula. The median position number, which row in the Excel sheet do I want after I delete any header rows, like row number one? The position number of the median in a sorted list of n quantitative data values is given by this formula. n plus one all divided by two. So for the 45 presidents, 45 plus one is 46, and then 46 divided by two is 23. I wanted row 23 after I deleted the header row. Now, if n equals five, as in our first example, the median position number is, well, five plus one is six, divide six by two, and you get three. So that means that after you've sorted the values, remember, you have to sort first. After you've sorted the values, we get the median as our third lowest value. So if you know the lowest value, the second lowest value, and then once you find the third lowest value, you know that's the median. You don't have to worry about sorting the rest. The remaining values were both hundreds anyway. Now, what if n equals four? All right, well then the median position number is given by four plus one, which is five, and then divide five by two, you get 2.5. Now, there's no row 2.5 in an Excel spreadsheet. What this means is that you take the average of the second and third lowest numbers. So in an Excel spreadsheet, once you've deleted the header row, you would average, and after you've sorted the values with any names or whatever, then you want the average of the entries in row two and row three. So in this case here, the second lowest score was 80 points. The third lowest score was 83 points. So the median is the, is the average of these. It's like position 2.5 in a way. The median is 81.5 points. In a way, it's in position 2.5. There's some books that say that the median can be any value between 80 and 83, but uh, we're going to do the more conventional route. We're going to take the average between the two values, 81.5 points. All right, now let's say that we have 99 data values. Oops, let's say we have 99 data values. Imagine a big Excel spreadsheet. Let's say we have 99 data values. The median position number is given by 99 plus one, which is 100, and then you take that, divide by two, and you get 50. So if your Excel spreadsheet goes from row one to row 99, and you don't have any headers, right, then you want the entry in position 50, row number 50, after you've done what? After you've done sorting. So after a sort, okay? Either from lowest to highest or highest to lowest. By convention, we normally go lowest to highest right? You want the 50th, the 50th lowest value, which will also be the 50th highest value. 
So the median is both the 50th lowest and the 50th highest number in the list. Okay, the median would be in position number 50. You will have 49 numbers below it. Ties are allowed, however. And you would have 49 numbers above it. Although, again, ties are allowed. So you could have ties around here, for example, and that's okay. All right. Median. Including the median position number, uh, which will tell you uh, which lowest value you, do you need, which is the same as which highest value do you need. Uh, in this case, if you have 99 data values, you want the 50th lowest or the 50th highest value. Okay? It's whatever number is in row number 50 in the Excel spreadsheet. If you, again, <laughs> sort first, remember this is after sorting, and uh, if you delete, you have to delete any header rows, like our row number one. All right. We'll look at some more measures of center, or I should say representative measures of center, later. All right. Any questions? Any questions? We've discussed the mean, the straight up average, the arithmetic mean. We've discussed the median. We're going to look at a couple more. Any questions before we go on? Any questions before we go on? Uh, while we're at it, this might be a good time to uh, to play a little video here. While I'm bringing up the presidents, oh good, play a clip from The Simpsons. <laughs> I guess I should uh, repeat that. Okay, so regarding Excel, uh, you know, it's 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 nice to work with software, but you should show work as we normally do in class. And um, uh, regarding which is more accurate, we're going to see later on. Well, there are different arguments you can make. It's not that one's right or wrong necessarily. All right, please remember, please remind me to record if I forget to record, okay? All right, that's one price to play these videos, but I think it's worth it. All right, uh, let's go on. Hi, everyone. Uh, one last comment about medians. Uh, let's go to our president's data set here. We have the 45 president's ages, all right? Uh, the median position number was 23 which means that after we've sorted and deleted any header rows, okay, we want the 23rd youngest age. The 23rd youngest age on row 23 was Benjamin Harrison's age of 55 years. The median position number was 23. The median is 55 years. Notice there are 22 ages below the 55 years, and there are 22 ages above the 55 years. Remember, ties are okay. Ties are okay, but basically 22 ages above the 55 years, but ties are okay. All right, so 22 ages above the 55 years, 22 ages above the 55 years, but ties are okay. Okay. Next, our third measure of center or representativeness is called the mode. Actually, this is the answer to the fourth question I first asked, which was, uh, how would you find a measure of center in 10 seconds? What's a very fast way of finding a central or representative measure? Let's go to the 100 data values, right? Well, how would you find a representative measure in 10 seconds? I'll give you a hint. Remember when we dealt with histograms? When we talked about modality, what were we referring to? We're referring to the, the idea of a hum, right, in the data. Frequent data, frequently occurring data, at least by class. Here we're being a bit more precise with our notion of mode. We want the most frequent value. And it turns out the most frequent value, okay, actually I don't even know what the most frequent value here is. <laughs> I don't even know what the mode is for this data set. But I know that the mode for this data set we have the five data values here. I know the mode here is going to be 100 points. The mode, specifically, again, the definition here is a bit more precise than what we had for histograms. But uh, the mode is the most frequent data value, if any, in the data set. And we're using this term a bit differently from the notion of humps and histograms, which is a bit more fluid. So again, because 100 points was the most frequently occurring data value here, it appears twice, the mode is 100 points. Now, in that sense, 
100 points may be the most representative data value in a sense, but is it appropriate as a measure of center? That's debatable. So although the mode is easy to find and it's an easy idea, there are several cons with it. So on the one hand, it's wonderful that the idea is so easy and we can usually find it quickly. Well, is it really so wonderful? <laughs> Uh, by the way, don't have to worry about the whole decimal, going one decimal point further ratio. Don't worry about that for modes. Pros and cons of modes. Uh, although it's, it's often easy to find modes, and also we can use it for qualitative data, as we'll see below, there's some problems. They might be questionable as measures of centrality for quantitative data. Again, is 100 points really appropriate as a measure of center for this data set? Um, in fact, the mode might actually be an extreme value, as in this example one, all right? Uh, if anything, maybe the test was fairly easy and you just had a bunch of uh, students scoring 100 points. In general, if you have a test that's fairly easy, you might have a bunch of students getting 100 points and maybe the mode will be 100 points, even though a lot of the students don't get anywhere near 100 points. Uh, on the other hand, you could have a very hard physics exam where the mode is zero points, although that might not be a very encouraging thing to tell the class. <laughs> and it may not be appropriate as a measure of center, necessarily. Or, you know, a mode may just be the result of coincidence. Hopefully not cheating, <laughs> but uh, maybe just the result of coincidence. So I do question the idea of the mode being a measure of center. Also, uh, unlike with the mean or the median, there might not be a mode. Uh, look at this data set. 2.41 and 3.62 and 7.25, there is no mode. There's a mean, there's a median, it's this guy, right? But there's no mode. On the other hand, this data set, 50 and 50 and 70 and 90 and 90, this has two modes, 50 points, oops, 50 points and 90 points. This data set is bimodal. We have the 50 points and we have the 90 points. This data set is bimodal. So we're using the term bimodal a bit more precisely than we use it over here. Uh, here, we have an example of a bimodal histogram or a bimodal distribution, but we, mean, but we mean that a bit more fluidly in the sense that uh, there may not have been two particular values that appeared more frequently than others, but we had, you know, we had a range of values here and a range of values here that were more frequent than other ranges or classes of values. Okay, here we're very precise. 50 points and 90 points both appear more frequently than the 70 points. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, unlike for mean and median, the mode can be used for qualitative data, okay, such as presidential parties. Okay, uh, so if you accept this as the frequency table for the parties of the presidents, okay, so the modal class here would be Republicans. Okay, and there were 19 of them. So the mode here would not be 19, it would be Republican. That's the value of the party variable. Uh, this would be a, a, a qualitative or nominal or categorical value for a uh, qualitative or nominal or categorical variable, right? The mode here would be Republican because it was the most frequent value for the party variable, the party qualitative variable. However, there is no mean or median here. Uh, what would be the mean or average of 19 Republicans and 16 Democrats? What, John McCain? No, no, you don't do that. <laughs> the mode here would just be Republican. Okay, so we've talked about the mean, the median, and the mode. Next up, what if you had 20 seconds to come up with a quantitative measure for center of this data set, a measure of center or representative data value for this data set? You have 20 seconds to find it. I'll give you a hint. You might want to find two special values first. That's next time. And uh, people have mentioned this before. So what could you do to get our fourth measure? Take two very special values and do what with them? Any questions? Any questions? All right, let's go on.
Hi, everyone. Let's say you have 20 seconds to find a measure of center, a representative value, for these 100 test scores. I'll give you a hint. What two magical values could you find first, and then what could you do with them? 20 seconds to do this without a calculator. What two values could you look for, and what could you do with them? How about this? Find the lowest value, called the min. Find the highest value, called the max. And then do what with them? How about take their average? That's called finding the mid-range. Our fourth measure, the mid-range, which is nowhere near as common as the other three. But let's talk about it. The mid-range is the average of, or the midpoint between, the lowest and the highest values of the data set. Uh, the lowest value we often call the min, and there could be ties, but the lowest value we often call the min, the highest value we often call the max. The mid-range is the average of the min and max scores. So min plus max all over two. Of course, you could switch min and max. It could be max plus min all over two. Remember, addition is commutative. Order does not matter. Bottom line, you average the two extreme scores, Right? You add them up, divide by two. Again, the min is the lowest value in the data set. There could be ties. The max is the highest data, is the highest value in the data set. There could be ties. And make sure to process or group the numerator before dividing by two. Anytime we take an average, we have to do that. We have to group the numerator. All right, so for our 100, sorry, not 100, for our five test scores, <laughs> For our five test scores, what would be the mid-range? The min would be the 76 points over here. The max would be the max would be either of the hundreds. Either of the hundreds. Okay, so the mid-range is the min plus the max all over two. 76 plus 100 all over 2, 88 points. 88 points is the average of 76 points and 100 points. It's like the midpoint between the two on the real number line. All right. And you can find this on uh, uh, Excel, using Excel. Let's go straight to the presence data set. Okay, so we found the average, the median, all right, let's find the mid-range. Okay. Well, we might be curious, what's the min age? I have the instructions on the left, I'll type this in. Min, B2 colon B46, or swipe your mouse and uh, shade in the data values you care about. Okay, the min is 42. Uh, as you might see here, whoops. Okay, uh, yes, the youngest president, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, when he succeeded William McKinley, he was 42 years old. I do it in red. <laughs> okay. President McKinley was assassinated. Teddy Roosevelt became president at age 42. That was the min age. The max age equals max. Again, if you want, you could swipe your mouse and shade in these values. Click off. All right. End parenthesis. 70 years old. That was President Trump age right here. 70 for Trump over here. All right, order doesn't matter. Add these up in either order and then divide by two. That's how you take the average of these two ages. Okay, so parentheses, 42 plus 70 all over two. Okay. 56 years of age. So the, me so the mid range is 56 years. Okay, it happens to be pretty close to the mean and the median. Mid range is 56 years, which seems reasonable. 56 years seems to be a reasonable measure of center or a representative measure. Uh, you could combine everything all at once. Uh, you could say, uh, you know, it, it's the min of B2 to B46 plus the max of B2 to B46 all over 2. Do it in one fell swoop. 
you don't have to do these separately. Okay. Likewise, over here, mid-range equals uh, the min from B2 to B6 plus the max from B2 to B6. That's all divided by 2. 88 points, as we saw in our example here. Okay, 88 points. Also remember the mode, uh, right? Uh, measure number 3, the mode. Uh, there's a straight-up command for that, mode. From B2 to B6, it was 100 points, right? Obviously, I hope you don't need Excel to figure out that the mode is 100 points. <laughs> you can see the mode is most frequent. The 100 points is most frequent. However, uh, I don't blame you if you need mode for this data set, the presence data set. Mode from B2 to B46, 54 years. 54 was the most frequent. Okay. In blue, let's try to pick them up. 54. See, Van Buren was 54. Uh, let's see, Hayes was 54, McKinley was 54, <laughs> okay, the man whom Teddy Roosevelt succeeded. So the median, sorry, the mode was followed by the min over here. Okay, uh, 54, who was 54? George W. Bush was 54. So, wow, we had five presidents who were 54 years old when they became president. 54 years was the mode. All right, so the four measures of center. The four classic measures of center, or representative measures, mean, median, mid-range, and mode. Again, mean, median, mid-range, and mode. Uh, here the mode was a fair bit different from the others. Uh, over here, all four measures were fairly similar. Mean, the mean and the median were equal at 55 years. The mid-range was 56 years. The mode was 54 years. All four measures were very close. However, they don't have to be close, as we'll see later on. All right, any questions before we go on? Whoops. Okay, any questions Here's before we go on? As we'll see later on. Okay, any questions? Going on to notation. Hi, everyone. Some comments about notation now. All right, so remember, Capital N is the population size for a population data set. Like if we have a census, like the census of 45 ages for the 45 presidents. Little n is the sample size for a sample data set. So let's say that uh, we have 100 million registered voters in Fredonia, and we take a poll of 1,000 registered voters. Then little n would be 1,000. It's a part of the overall population that we're sampling and its size is 1,000, little n. Now, we can label the data values, whether we're dealing with population or sample data, we can label the data values x sub i, where i is a subscript. But don't worry, we won't need subscripts too often uh, in this class, actually. But I want to talk about the precise notation here. Okay, so uh, for sample data or for population data, all right, uh, let's say that we consider the five test scores, all right? We have five students in the class. Let's say we have the population data set of five test scores in points. Capital N, the population size is five. X of one, student number one score is 80 points. X of two, student number two score is 76 points. Oops. Oops. <laughs> right. And so forth. X of three, student number three scores 100 points. X of four, Student number four scores 83 points. X sub five, student number five score is also 100 points. We have a tie here. Okay, so we can label data values X sub i, where i is an index taking on the values between one and n. Capital N for population data, little n for sample data. All right, now we normally don't have to deal with subscripts. Um, so Let's say that we want to add values together, all right? Summation notation. You, you may remember this fellow from your algebra class. That's the Greek letter uppercase sigma. His little brother, lowercase sigma, is going to be famous later on. That's this guy. He's going to represent standard deviation. But this is uppercase sigma, and it's a summation operator, meaning that something like this denotes the sum of the given data values. So if I want to add the values from x sub 1 through x sub 5, 
I could just write it like that, all right? Summation X. Now, more precisely, if you're dealing with a population data set, you'd write something like this. Summation X sub I from I equals one to capital N, which really means this. Uh, or if you, if you have sample data, you'd have summation X sub I, where I goes from one to little n, which means this. That's the sum of a sample data set. But we don't worry about the distinction. Bottom line is summation X, that's the sum of the given data values given the context, whether it's population data or sample data. All right. So in example one, we can denote the sum of the five scores by this, which means that, adding up the five scores. All right. Now, how do we do notation for means? Well, it depends on whether we're dealing with a population data set or a sample data set. If we have a population data set, then we can compute a population mean. Okay, now uh, the population mean for a population of size capital N, the population mean is denoted by the Greek letter mu. Cat says mu. <laughs> it's like a U that needs a haircut, like me. All right, uh, and we typically use Greek letters like mu to denote population parameters, values that describe a population. So if we have a census, if we have all the population data values, like the 45 presence ages, then we can compute the population mean, a value for mu. All right. Now, how do we find a mean in general? How do we find a mean? We have these five, oops, we have these five data values, all right? We have these five data values. How do you calculate the mean? You add them all up, and then you divide by five, the number of data values. So here is the formula. In a way, it's our first formula. It's our formula for a population mean. The population mean is given by, well, the sum of the data values at hand divided by oops, once again, <laughs> it's the sum of the data values at hand, right? Divided by the number of values, the population size. I'm assuming that we have complete data. We have a complete data set. So it's the sum of the data values divided by the number of values. Summation X all over capital N. Now let's say that instead of uh, population data, this was sample data. Sample data where little n, the sample size, was five. So let's say we had a big lecture hall class at a university with a thousand students. And our TA, Igor, randomly grabs five tests. And let's say that these are the five sample values, right? Well, we have sample data then. And we can find the sample mean denoted by X bar. We typically use Roman or English letters to denote sample statistics, not Greek letters. Uh, sample statistics are values that describe a sample, like a sample mean. But to find a sample mean, it's the same basic idea. You add up all the values at hand, the values in our sample, and you divide by the number of values at hand. The sample size is little n. So the formula for sample mean is very similar to the formula for population mean. Here we divide by the population size, here we divide by the sample size. But basically on the top, we're adding up all the values at hand. Okay. Uh, and many calculators have an X bar button that, allow, that will allow you to compute the mean of inputted data. So uh, on a scientific calculator, you should be able to input data and calculate a sample mean. Although I may have you show work on homework. In fact, do show your work on homework. All right, until then. All right, any questions about notation? So notation for a population mean, sample mean, basically a sum over the uh, population or sample size, right? But uh, this is like a, an introduction to notation. Get used to this notation. Any questions? Any questions? All right, let's proceed. Hi, everyone. 
let's talk about the effect of outliers or relatively extreme values. Let's say that five students in a class take a test. So we have a census and their test scores and points are as follows. 70, 80, 90, 90, and 100 points. They're sorted. So first off, find for me the median of this data set. It should be easy because the test scores are already sorted. Well, uh, since they're already sorted, you can grab the middle value. Okay, it is in fact the 90 points here. So the median is 90 points. How would you find the mean, the arithmetic mean or average for this data set? Well, you would add up the five data values and divide by five. You get 86.0 points. Now, what about the min range? The min value, the lowest value is 70 points. It's easy to find in this sorted data set. The highest value, the max, is 100 points. The mid range is at the midpoint of these two, is the average of these. It's going to be 85 or 85.0 points. I'll go ahead and put the extra decimal place there. The mode, by the way, is what? The mode is 90 points. Okay, now let's say that the person who scored the 70 actually cheated. Ooh, bad student. And we drop that score down to zero points. And I'm going to keep that zero points in there, maybe to embarrass the student. <laughs> Folks, I like being a nice teacher, but not the cheaters. Okay, now what impact, what effect does that have on the median and the mean, and also the mid-range, and the mode for that matter? <laughs> All right, so let's look at this modified data set. So the person who gets a 70, that person gets knocked down to a zero. All right, so let's do a comparison here. All right, the old median was 90 points. Look at this new data set. It's still sorted. What is the new median? Well, the median is still the central value in this sorted data set is the third lowest value, the 90 points. So the median does not change. The median is still 90 points. It doesn't change at all. What happens to the mean? Oh, by the way, so I'll, I'll uh, write that in here. <laughs> write that in here. The median doesn't change. Uh, bear in mind, uh, if the 70 had, uh, well, well, I've, <laughs> Actually, the, yeah, the mean doesn't change, bottom line. Median doesn't change. Now, what about the mean? What about the mean? Well, that changes because instead of a 70, we have a zero being added into that sum on top, right? Okay, so the mean, you add these up, divide by five, we lose 70 from the sum. So the mean plummets 14 points from 86.0 points down to 72.0 points. The mean changes significantly, changes significantly. Right. Now what about the mid-range? Okay, the mid-range was 85 points, the average of 70 points and 100 points. Now the mid-range is the average of, look at this, zero points and 100 points. The mid-range plummets 35 points all the way down to 50.0 points. Here the mid-range changes dramatically. Can I put the adverbs in here? <laughs> Changes dramatically. All right. Okay, so the mid-range gets hit most of all because the mid-range relies on the most extreme values, the min and the max. So in terms of sensitivity to outliers, the median was not sensitive at all. We still had 90 points. The mean was sensitive. We plummeted, we, we dropped 86 points from 70 to 72 points. And the mid-range plummeted from 85 points all the way down to 50 points. The mid-range was very sensitive to outliers. An outlier, again, is an extreme value relative to the rest of the data. The zero points here is an outlier. So let's reiterate. Okay, the zero points again is an outlier 
because it is an extremely low value relative to the other data values. Of course, an outlier can also be extremely high. Uh, if this test were out of 1,000 points, someone scoring 1,000, like maybe uh, Albert Einstein on the physics test, uh, would be extremely high. So as we've seen, the mean is sensitive to outliers. Uh, the mean can be greatly affected to outliers. Uh, not necessarily, but it's often greatly affected by outliers. Uh, in this example, the mean dropped 14 points from 86 points to 72 points. The median is not sensitive to outliers. It stayed at 90 points in our two examples here. The median is not sensitive to outliers. The mid-range was very sensitive to outliers because that plummeted from 85 points to 50 points. From 85 points up here to 50 points down here. So again, the mean was sensitive to outliers. The median was not. The mid-range was sensitive, in fact, very sensitive to outliers. Now, if you omit outliers, like I did earlier in a previous video, um, although it's tempting to, sim to simply omit outliers, we're generally not supposed to. If you do omit an outlier, uh, like remember uh, uh, when I took the student who got 100 points before and knocked that person out, okay, uh, you better say so and give a good reason why. You don't want to be accused of tampering with your data. So if you omit outliers, you better say so and say why. Okay. And sometimes we give results both before and after outliers are removed so that there's context. All right. Now, in light of outliers, you might wonder, well, can we get a more stable measure of center? And the trim mean is a modification of the idea of a mean that will help reduce the effect of outliers. So for example, a 10% trim mean is obtained by taking the average of the data set after the bottom 10% and the top 10% of the sorted data values have been deleted. Okay, so you're basically crossing out uh, the bottom 10% of data and the top 10% of data. For a 20% trim mean, the bottom 20% and the top 20% are deleted or omitted. So for example, if we do a 20% trim mean for both data sets in example three, where the lowest score was either a zero or a 70, either way, and the highest score was 100. Right. Well, our uh, population size was 5. 20% of 5 is 1. So if we lop off the 1 lowest score, which is either the 0 or the 70, and the 1 highest score, which is the 100, then the 20% trimmed mean would be obtained by averaging the middle three values in this case. So in both cases, whether the lowest value was a zero or a 70, it didn't matter. Uh, we're left with the test scores 80 points, 90 points, and 90 points. We average those, and the 20% trim mean is about 86.7 points to one decimal place. Again, the key purpose of the trim mean is to reduce the effect of outliers, so that if you have Albert Einstein in your physics class, or the ghost of Albert Einstein in your physics class, uh, or on the other hand, someone who never ever studies, so is always messing up a reporting of the data, someone who never ever studies and always gets a zero, you don't want that person being counted either. The trim mean is more stable. So as we go from quiz one to quiz two to quiz three, the trim mean would give you a better reporting on how overall the class is doing. We ignore the outliers. Albert Einstein and uh, the person who never studies. All right, next, we'll talk more about uh, how the mean and the median are affected by outliers and issues of symmetry, skewness, and outliers. How can these issues here affect means and medians? Next time. All right, let's get right to it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. What impact can symmetry, skewness, and outliers have on means and medians? All right, we'll take a look at this symmetric distribution over here. It's perfectly symmetric. You can think of this as a smoothed out histogram of test scores. Now over here, notice that the mean and the median are exactly the same, 75 points. If you have a perfectly symmetric distribution, the mean and the median will coincide. They'll be the same score in points. Now, 
if the distribution is pretty close to symmetric, is approximately symmetric, and if there are no outliers, then the mean should be close to the median. So if you basically have symmetry and there aren't extreme outliers, extreme values, then the mean should be close to the median. Again, outliers could change that, as we've seen before. Outliers could change that. In particular, outliers can drag the mean away from the median. That's where skewness comes in. All right, so let's say that you have a histogram of test scores that smoothed out looks like this. Remember, this is left skewness. Skewness follows the tail. We have a left tail here. Kind of like quiz one in a class where most of the students do pretty well, but you have a long tail of students who just aren't prepared for the class or don't study. And these are students who may drop throughout the semester. Now the left skewness of this distribution is pulling the mean lower than the median. Okay, so the mean here is being pulled by this tail lower than the median. So the median is very stable. The median separates the bottom 50% from the top 50%. But because of the skewness, because of all these extremely low values here, maybe including some outliers, because of this long left tail here, the mean is being dragged to the left lower than the median. So the very low values are pulling the mean to the left. Now I have a question for you. Think about it. What typically happens to exam means and medians as the term progresses and students drop out of the class? Again, some dark humor here. If I put a big X over here and a lot of these students drop, what happens to the median and the mean? Well, the median should rise a bit, okay? So the new median might be over here. I'll, I'll put this in green. The new median might be over here, okay? But the mean should be a lot closer to the median. I'll put that in red again. The new mean should be closer to the median. So if the tail starts to get lopped off, and as we move away from skewness and more towards symmetry, perhaps, the mean and the median should start to converge. They should get closer together. So if we're going from, from skewness towards symmetry, perhaps, we would expect that the mean would get closer to the median and they would both rise. The mean and the median should generally get closer and they should both rise. In my experience as a TA and a teacher, I've seen that generally happen where both the mean and the median overall would rise, and the mean and the median would tend to get closer together. All right. For a right skew distribution, a physics class, <laughs> okay, uh, the skewness over to the right, the right skewness would tend to pull the mean to the right above the median. Okay, so the very high values would tend to pull the mean to the right. So I guess hypothetically, if a bunch of these students in the right tail go, hey, this physics class is too easy for us, let's take the next physics class up, then I suppose the mean would converge towards the median, and then both of these would go down. Although in practice, that doesn't happen so often. More often I see this happening, where, where students over in the left tail drop out, uh, and the mean and the median both rise and get closer together. So again, skewness tends to pull the mean away from the median towards the tail, but if the tail starts to drop off, then the mean and the median tend to converge. So now the mean may be better than the median for roughly symmetric distributions. They should be similar anyway, right? The mean and the median should be very similar anyway for symmetric distributions. And the mean is probably better because the mean is more often used in formulas than the median mode and the mid-range are. Uh, also, I'm assuming that there are no extreme outliers. Outliers can also mess things up. Okay, so the mean may be better than the median for roughly symmetric distributions, especially if there are few, if any, outliers. Okay, because the mean is more often used in formulas. It's more natural, mathematically. But the median may be more appropriate than the mean as a measure of center for skewed distributions. Okay, like for example, on a first exam, I'll do this in purple. On a first exam, on a first quiz, the distribution may, may, may look more like that. And then the students might be going, well, you know what? The people at the lower end may end up dropping anyway. So perhaps the median would be a better measure of the center than the mean is. The, because the mean 
may be too impacted, may be too affected by students who may not be in the class by the end anyway. So the median may be more appropriate than the mean as a measure of center for skew distributions. Although, as long as there's no fraud and the median and the mean are computed appropriately, I cannot say that the median is wrong or the mean is wrong. I'm just making some arguments, some pro and con arguments for and against the median and the mean. I'm not saying that one is necessarily outright wrong and that the other is necessarily outright correct. There are argues, arguments to be made for or against either. Uh, so the median may be more appropriate than the mean as a measure of center for skewed distributions, uh, and also if there are outliers. Okay, that would tend to make us prefer the median, because outliers can have a weird effect on the mean, as we've seen before. Remember, uh, we, uh, here, when we dropped the 70 down to a zero, the mean went from 86 points all the way down to 72 points. So outliers can have a great impact uh, on the mean, the mid-range, not so much the mode or the median. A minor footnote here. Uh, remember, the sample mean is often denoted by x bar. The median is sometimes denoted by x tilde, that squiggle on top. The mode sometimes is denoted by x hat. Uh, but those are fairly rare. The key thing is remember that the sample mean of a sample data set is given by x bar. In the next lesson, we're going to have more fun with means. In particular, weighted means like your GPA. That's next time. Oh, yes. Maybe the most important part of the class, your GPA. All right, that's it. Thank you for staying a little bit late. <laughs> uh, any questions? Any questions? I still have the recording on. Uh, any sort of public questions now? Uh, otherwise, I'll stop the recording soon. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to sort of private comments or just within the attendees. Uh, any questions? Okay, uh, thank you for attending. Okay, uh, any questions in the recorded portion at this point? Any questions? Okay, thank you all for attending. I'll now stop the recording, but I'll wait and I'll see if anyone has any sort of private or in-class questions with the remaining attendees. I'll stop the recording now.